Chief Administrator for the National Highway Safety Traffic Administration. Uh, Ms. Strickland oversees the broad range of vehicle safety and policymaking programs under NHTSA's jurisdiction. He leads the agency in its efforts to educate communities on a variety of preventable vehicle-related uh, injury problems. For instance, the da danger of driving under uh, alcohol, the influence of alcohol, seatbelt use, and addresses also pedestrian safety concerns. Mr. Strickland is a, uh, has overseen the development of the first national fuel efficiency program and has really uh, brought focus to the problem of uh, child passenger safety, which we're very appreciative of Mr. Strickland, including the threat of heat stroke from hot cars and back over uh, deaths, uh, rollover deaths. Prior to his appointment at NISTA, Mr. Strickland, Mr. Strickland served on the staff of the U.S. Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation. And in that role, he advised congressional members on safety reforms and funding increases for very important safety reform measures in seatbelt and drunk driving grant programs. And in fact, for his work, he earned national recognition from Mothers Against Drunk Driving, who named him Congressional Staffer of the Year in 2004 for this role in making driving safety. Safer. Additionally, and lastly, he is a certified child passenger safety seat technician, and we're grateful for that. Let's give a warm welcome to Mr. David Smith. Uh, finally, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jody Edwards, who is going to uh, talk to us about her story and her family. And again, I just want to reiterate that, you know, this issue really does touch everyone. And we need to be able to think about every single day what we can do to make our babies safer. And it has to be a layered approach. I agree with Jeanette, is that you know technology is one layer, but it always comes down to personal responsibility and how we deal with this. And all of it together, we can't get this number down to zero. Now, Dr. Edwards is a fantastic person, a fantastic parent, and, and I think it's our opportunity to really appreciate, you know, what it's like to have lost a child, to lose a to lose a, pre a precious baby when you do all that you can to make sure you keep them safe. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jody Evans. I'm grateful to join kidsandcars.org, Safe Kids, NHTSA, and Children's Mercy Hospital to talk about this important issue. Four years ago, this past Monday, I unknowingly left my 11-month-old baby, Jenna, in my car while I worked, and sadly, she died of heat stroke. I'm sharing my story with you today in hopes that you will understand that even loving, attentive parents need to know about the dangers of hot cars. I'm a conscientious person in every area of my life, including my role as a mother. And because I'm a warrior by nature, I have always taken child safety seriously. I kept mini blind cords wrapped up, medicines and cleaners locked away, heavy furniture secured to the wall, I researched the safest car seats for days before settling on one with good ratings, and I was careful to never leave my kids alone in a car, not even for a minute. Being a mother was the most important part of my life. I chose a job with flexible hours so I could be home with them more. I nursed my babies, and my favorite things were playing with them, rocking them, and singing to them. I don't tell you all of these things to convince you that I'm a good mother. Rather, I'm urging you to realize that I'm no different than you. I love my children fiercely and would do anything to keep them safe. While I knew that I needed to protect my children from dangerous things in the world, never in a million years would I have thought that I needed to protect my children from me. In fact, when I was still pregnant with Jenna, I heard a news story about a child who died when her mom unknowingly left her in a car while she was at work. I didn't even stop to listen to the story or to think how this might happen. This woman was portrayed as a negligent mother who didn't make her child her top priority. I bought it and believed I was immune from this type of tragedy. The week that Jenna died was the first week of a new routine for all of us. Um, all summer long, I had been taking Jenna and her brother to the same babysitter. And the day she died, I needed to drop my son off at his preschool and then take Jenna to the babysitter's house, which was directly across the parking lot from my work. Jenna and I played with her brother at school for about 20 minutes. Then we got back in the van and headed toward my work and the babysitter's house. 
I made a very brief call to my husband to share the good news that my son did great at drop off and then I did not use my cell phone the rest of the drive. I kept my eye on Jenna in the baby safety mirror until she fell asleep about five minutes later. My goal had been to get Jenna to the babysitter so that she could get her morning nap. When I saw in the rearview mirror that she had fallen asleep, I started to think about that morning nap. I came up with a plan for how to get her into the babysitter's house without waking her up so she could continue her nap. Over the course of a few minutes, I visualized myself carefully and quietly getting Jenna out of the van when we arrived at the sitters. I pictured myself undoing the straps of her car seat, gently lifting her out to cradle her in my arms. I saw myself cover her ear so the sound of the babysitter's door would not wake her. And I whispered to the babysitter, who I imagined wearing a black and white floral shirt, Jenna's asleep. Can I put her in the crib so she can finish her nap? Somehow, and I know it is hard to understand, my brain flipped a switch as I continued my drive to work. As the remaining 15 minutes passed, I went from knowing she was in the back seat to firmly believing she was safely at the babysitter's. I'm not an expert in how the brain works, but since Jenna died, I've learned that the part of the brain that controls routine behaviors can override the part of the brain that controls newer behaviors. My brain grasped onto the old routine of just making one daycare stop and use the details from that visualization to create a memory of doing something I really had not done. This processing error allowed me to leave her in the van without realizing I had done so. As I approached my work, instead of going just a half a block further to the babysitters, I pulled into the parking lot confident that my valued mother responsibilities had been taken care of that morning. I took my bags out of the front seat of my car and I walked into my office never realizing that my daughter was in danger. One of the more painful things that I heard strangers say about me once the news carried stories of Jenna's death was, how could you not think of your child all day? How could you forget your child? In my mind, I hadn't forgotten her. I had misremembered. I thought she was dropped off safely. Just 20 minutes after I arrived at work, I emailed a friend and included a paragraph about how big Jenna was getting. I cleaned my office that day and hung up a new picture of Jenna and her brother on my bulletin board. I carried my phone with me all day, specifically in case I would get a call, that rare call from the babysitter that one of my kids needed me. And I was eager to leave work at the end of the day to go get her and then my son. I thought of them several times throughout the day and I even talked on the phone with my husband three times that day never thinking that anything was wrong. At the end of the day, when I found Jenna in my van, as I backed out of my parking space, my belief that I had dropped her off safely was so solid that I couldn't figure out who put her there. In fact, I looked further into the van to see if someone had also put my son there. When I couldn't recall what the babysitter said to me during drop off, it only took me a moment to realize that I had made a horrible mistake. And even though the public spotlight and treatment was fierce at times, um, nothing can compare to what it's like to lose a child. I hope that those of you listening will help raise awareness that all parents and caregivers are at risk for unknowingly leaving a child in a car. Kidsincars.org, Safe Kids, NHTSA all have great safety tips for people who transport young children and the only way to prevent unknowingly leaving a child in a car is to check the back seat every time you exit your vehicle. I have talked to dozens of families who have lost children to vehicular heat stroke. This happens to good, loving families. And the only thing we all have in common is that none of us realized our love wasn't enough to protect our children from our imperfect brains. Thank you. Jody, thank you so much for that incredibly compelling story. And we're going to close now, but I just 
want to say that I'm going to go back in and I'm going to go into a trauma room and there may be or a trauma center and there may be a trauma and we'll gather our team together but all of you people here are members of that trauma team prevention is part of our effort you may be invisible in the room but you are there Jody especially you your, so, your story is compelling and any amount of PowerPoints or data can't convince people but stories like you do so please all of you keep up the excellent work and thank you everybody for coming Yeah, my daughter's name is Jenna. Sure, when I first found her, you know, I had believed that she was safely at the babysitters all day. And, um, you know, when I first found her, that belief was so firm that I wasn't sure who had put her there. Um, and in fact, you know, looked further into the van to see if someone had also put my son there. And then it only took me a few moments to realize that I had made a horrible mistake. Um, and what, what was your thought process, uh, I guess, when you were acting that once you realized that? Sure, I don't, it's probably, it's hard to say because I was so devastated and shattered that I literally felt like I might die um, and barely had any strength to speak or walk, um, just pure devastation. The, the way you kind of described the, the memory being um, like, put, like thinking about what you were going to do and that becoming a memory, that's, that's kind of scary. I mean, I mean, is that, uh, I guess, what's it like to know that, you're, that a person's brain can do that? It's horrifying to think that the value or the love that you have for a person or the importance of an event or an object doesn't matter. That your brain functions out of habit and routine, regardless of how important a person is or an event, um, and routine can take over. I do. Um, at the time, I had um, an older son, and I've had two children since Jenna died. And how, how's your family doing? You know, I have a great family, a very supportive family, and they know me better than anyone knows me. Um, so they've been very supportive of me, and certainly we've had a difficult journey, a difficult road of things, because it's very painful to lose a child and to have a person from our family missing. Um, and so it is difficult, but we are very supportive of one another and do well together. What? I mean, I feel like this, not being able to be in a position, but I feel like this has got to be tough to get out and share your sure. your story mm -hmm. over and over again. Why, sure. why, why are you doing it? I do it uh, to try to get an accurate story out there so that parents will realize that this can happen to anyone. Um, as I said, when I was still pregnant with Jenna, um, I heard a story of this happening to a mother and a child dying, and it was presented as if she was a very negligent mother with little regard for a child. It wasn't true, but I didn't know it at the time. And when I heard the story, I believed this issue wasn't relevant to me. Because um, I thought, for sure, I, lo I love my kids, I make them my top priority, and so certainly I could never leave my child behind in a car. So it's important to me to help other parents, other caregivers uh, realize that this really can happen to anyone. Yeah, we've, we've done or heard about these stories a lot, and you hear a lot of people say that, like you said, that they, that would never happen. Mm -hmm. What would you say to a mother out there who's watching this and says, you know, I, I know what you're saying, but I, I wouldn't do that? I would say don't make the same mistake that I made, and even if you feel sure that this wouldn't happen to you, that it won't hurt to take safety precautions anyway. And we ask people to put something in the back seat with the child that they will need regardless of routine. It's not because the object is more important, but it's because it's something that they will need even if they experience a change in routine. Do you think there's a lack of understanding of the, I guess, the, the brain mechanism? Oh, sure, sure. I mean, I do think there's a lack of understanding about how the brain functions, and we believe that our love um, will override the failures that the brain can make and so it's just hard for us to believe and I have compassion for that that a lot of parents don't understand that this can happen to them.